but we are prophesying. Breathe into us while you minister your word. We're believing you together. We're going for being with me. No, this is God's answer to the old covenant. There. Yes, so let's read with understanding. To them which are in Christ Jesus. Not do, and that it was weak through the flesh. God said. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh. To the law of God, neither indeed can be. Spirit of God dwelling. I'm always in the Spirit. I wish I'd believe the Bible. I wish you'd believe the Bible. If the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead will flesh, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But you've not received. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. And that we may also be glorified. Secure. Irrefutable seed.
No farmer in his right mind. Buddy, he said he put the seed of righteousness in you. Sin, miss the mark. And God hath put his. For the earnest expectation of the creature. To vanity, that was Adam's pride, Adam's transgression. If you do this, you'll be like God. animal hope oh, and there's hope for all of creation and that hope is into the glorious liberty of the children of God. until now. And then he said, of what God started to wit to understand the redemption. Is the word soma? He's God's going to have to change it, but it will be His temple. is yet to come and of course Romans now why would you hope for what you already have
Unus wait. And he said, you've already lived and he never Why don't you tell, and I named some TV preachers that got Take this journey, then in Song of Sword. Take a people who are willing to. Under Herod began to kill babies. It was a time of warfare. Jesus came forth in the earth. In our Dead Sea is in Lancaster. Uh, the wicked are like a troubled sea. So we are. Tonight with God having established righteousness. It's non-negotiable. My soul is being renewed to the was rejuvenated, and Sarah's body was rejuvenated. now and putting off the deeds of the body and I thank God for that. And then the 
Father, Father. And God sent forth the Spirit of His Son, Jesus, into my heart, crying, Chapter 6. And every son he received. That it drives it out. The two cannot coexist. Says it with the light. The entrance of I have a relationship. He is my father. Both true. They're both necessary. There's six steps. Right with God. For the Lord say so, I am. And you probably were. To take over the world and all those things that used to be said, I can't. And it, it would just go on and on and on. Soon more. Theology was ingrained in me. In your days, go. Because to me, a diver, somebody dives in the water. Needless to say, thank God I'm not quite as dumb.
Palachi. Did you not? He said, hey, what's this? Sunshiny. See, I thought the whole world was cloudy. If my meeting on a on a Friday night. Pay somewhat attention. Every about the time you're going to bust hell wide open, then you drift out. Out there, and so we finally went to sleep. God, my food. What is wrong with you, boy? So needless to say, Okay, so I know these things. And when you put it all in a bag and mix it all all right so let's look at verse 20 
the storms in the sky, all that dimension. was brought into bondage. God never did. The number one serial killer in the earth the storms throughout history and subjected it to what it was. Down to New Orleans, it was preached and said. Particular week for all that's done. of it and I hear it's very wicked and get in there and begin to help people the wicked place God cleans New Orleans. I challenge you. In the New Covenant, there's only one way of cleaning. So the travail of creation comes because of creation, and he makes it clear here the whole of it is. Until and first. Hatred, the love of many is wax cold. Shed his grace on this nation.
The times and seasons coming. I want you to hear this and hear it well. There's enough trouble in the earth. Say because of what we've heard. To be sure, to be certain. Have a heart for God, there's something in you growing, and you know. And unveiled, you know that there's a cry in you. For example, uh, I was down at the old building. And uh, she said, what are you going to do about it? I said, well, the first thing we need. Our protection, I'll never leave you without. Well, they got any room on and tribulation food and tribulation kits will suck a tash. On and on. There were several people down there at the old building did that. Things and as we go in time, you're going to hear more and time. Time is not the issue for him. Truth is the issue. I 
I will make a way in the wilderness. made you to bloom like the rose. Behold, I do a new thing. thousand years ago God said and notice what this says and this is what people have missed verse 22 in Romans 8 we know the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now now if we're just going to take that as an increment of time then we're going to realize Paul said that about 1900 plus years ago and if that was true now then it would have to be much more true now and those pains probably would have destroyed creation by now if we're talking about time. But until now, so let's see if we can understand this. Then we know the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until the new covenant comes. Or until a people come into the new covenant. The creation's going to groan and the creation's going to rock and reel until someone takes that rightful place as sons and daughters because the earth is looking for sons and daughters. And until someone can step into now in the new covenant then there's never going to be a release of anything beyond just the struggle of what we're in. It'll never happen. There must be an until now, and we are in that until now. And he's not talking about time. He's talking about truth. He has saved the best wine until now. And now faith is. And now are we the sons of God. And what he's telling you here is this transition is from time to truth. And so the church has been enamored with, overwhelmed by seasons. I'm in a season of affliction. I'm in a season of adversity. I'm in a season of accusation. Those things come and go. They are external. They are beyond you. But the reality is you move from a time and season into the truth of the new covenant. And if you're in a season of affliction, the truth is you're healed. And if you're in a season of accusation, the truth is there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. And if you choose to set your mind over in the times and seasons, then you're going to rock and reel from the times and seasons rather than truth be established in present truth. Second Peter chapter one, verse 12. I would you be established in the present truth. It's truth that makes you free. Continue in my word. You'll know truth and truth shall make you free. Can you see that? The creation groans until now. Someone needs to step into now. Praise God. I'm a son of God now. I'm blessed now. I'm ready now. His name in my mouth now. I have authority over the curse now. And it's prophesied in Isaiah chapter 55. There'll come a people because the word has come down from heaven, which is Jesus, like the rain and snow, and has made the earth to bring forth and give seed to the soul and bread to the eater. He prophesied that the trees of the field will clap their hands. He prophesied that, that that creation out there is going to stand in attention because you walk by, because you are royalty, because you have been clothed with heaven, you are sons of the Most High God, and this is not only his planet, it's yours, because the earth is the Lord's, but it belongs to us. The meek shall inherit the earth, and the meek has, and we are heirs with him. This planet belongs to us. It does not belong to the wicked. It does not belong to the cursed and the doomed and the damned. It belongs to the sons and daughters of the Most High God. But how many people have you ever met that would even dare say that, much less believe that, it or prophesy it or start to live in it and the answer is until someone comes to now we're still going to have all this confusion even in the body of Christ and in the church till someone comes to now now tonight tonight I give you power to tread on serpents scorpions and over all the power of the enemy nothing shall by any means hurt you and so what you see then is God's now bringing the church to a transition that's going to produce change now, who will move with God from glory to glory and from faith to faith? And as we start this, five things the Lord gave me. 
Restoration, number one, of the Lordship of Christ. I'm going to show you that in the remainder of our lesson tonight. Number two, in the liberty of the children of God. The liberty of the children of God. Someone's going to start walking in freedom. If we wait on the rest of the body of Christ, we could be here, live and die and go and never come to it. God's called you to freedom whether anybody else ever walks in it or not. That's why in the midst, now just think about this. It's amazing. You go back to World War II and Hitler's regime and everything that happened along about 1935 to 45. That was the very height Smith Wigglesworth preached in. That was the zenith of his ministry, 35 to 48. And if you'll read his writings and his preaching, that man, as far as I could see, he never mentioned Adolf Hitler one time. He never mentioned bombs. He never mentioned war. He never mentioned Holocaust. He preached Jesus. And when I read that, some of that again today, I said, here's a man above and beyond his generation. This man's living in truth. He's not living in the times for the times where while he would preach even in England, there were places. George Stormont's own church got destroyed by a bomb. Told me that himself. Got destroyed by an actual bomb that the Germans dropped there in England. That happened. But Smith Wigglesworth would be preaching and that was not his concern. His concern was preaching the living Christ. That was his concern because he wasn't into the times and seasons. He was into the truth. And what a mark that man made on that generation. But I want to encourage you, it was only one man. Now, you can't find that from other people. You won't find a lot of other people in that season, that generation and time walking that way. But he did because he transcended. And if it was available for him, then it's available for you now. But you have to make the transition. Can you receive that? Liberty to the children. So what if nobody else walks in freedom? Praise God, you can have liberty. What if nobody else walks in health and strength? You can have it. Jesus paid for it. What if everybody else falls short? You don't have to fall short. What if everybody else gets riddled by fear? You don't have to be riddled by fear. You've got choices. You've got opportunity. God always gives opportunity. You've got opportunity tonight. You've got opportunity tonight. The liberty of the children. Number three, leadership in the church is going to be restored. It's pictured in the withered hand in the five-fold ministry and leadership being restored in the church. Because we're in a day where we have very few apostles. We have very few prophets that are really from the new covenant mercy seat. And most of all, as Paul said, you have 10,000 instructors in Christ. We've got 10,000 instructors, but they're not in Christ. Very few instructors in Christ. So leadership in the church being restored. Then number four is life in the covenant, life in confirmation. That's God said, I'll restore to you the ears, palmer worm, the locust, the canker worm and the caterpillar have eaten away. God said, I'll restore. God said that. God said that. And if God said that, then it is his eternal, ever-living word. And then finally, Romans chapter 8 said that the loosing of creation will come. Now, I do believe there's a progressive order here. And so in our generation, if it is not possible for us to bring this in and usher the kingdom of God in, in our generation. I don't know. I'm not sure. I don't, I've got questions I don't have answers for tonight. But I do know this. The Lord assured me today. There's a whole lot of stuff that is available for you to walk in no matter what anybody else does. It's available if you want it. But God's brought all of you to a point where he's brought you this far. Now it's not up to him because he's made the way. There's going to be some choices you make. And God still anoints choices. And you still have a will and you still have a choice and you come down to what you are going to lay your head into, what you're going to put your thought into. You come to a place where there are still choices to be made. So this transition, it's going to bring change. Let's go to 1 Chronicles chapter 12. Let's turn there tonight. 1 Chronicles chapter 12. Can you hear the word of the Lord tonight? First Chronicles 12. In verse 38, 39. First Chronicles 12, 38. And all these men of war that could keep rank came with a perfect heart to Hebron to make David king over all Israel. And all the rest also of Israel were of one heart to make David king. And there they were with David three days eating, drinking, for their brethren had prepared for them. Now this is a transition 
from Saul to David. Now let's notice some things. First of all, when you read this chapter in the transition, Jesus' Lordship. Jesus must be, and I've been preaching this for years, this is the way the Lord told me. Jesus must be the foundation of the church. Do I need to stop and preach that? On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. He must be the foundation. He must be the framework of the church. The church is fitly framed in him. He must be the fabric of the church. What makes the church attractive? What makes the church uh, absolutely irresistible is Jesus. Jesus is altogether lovely. If we come together in Christ, he's altogether lovely. When we're all together and we are of one accord, and by this all men will know that you're my disciples indeed and that you love one another. And you come together and we come together in that same spirit, he becomes the fabric of the church that makes the church attractive to the world. He becomes the light in the midst of the darkness. He becomes the glory in the midst of the shame, the mercy in the midst of the condemnation, the healing in the midst of sickness, the life in the midst of death the power in the midst of weakness and frailty. Jesus is the fabric of the church. He must be. He's the foundation. He's the framework. He's the fabric. He's the focus of the church. Everything should be focused in Jesus. We preach in him. We teach in him. We sing in him. We love in him. We serve in him. Everything in him I live and move and have my being. The focus. We were never meant to look anywhere but Jesus. Looking under Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith. And when your eyes are not on Jesus, they are misplaced. They are misfocused. And it always causes a digression when you take your eyes off Jesus. Faith will weaken. When you take your eyes off Jesus. Fear will grow when you take your eyes off Jesus. Doubts will assail you when you take your eyes off Jesus. But there's something about a man or a woman that will just sit their gaze in the heavens. Stephen, full of the Holy Ghost, said, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And when he saw Jesus, it gave him the grace and the glory to even get on his knees while being stoned and pray, Father, lay not this sin to their charge. When you see Jesus, there's an upward vision. There, oh, I saw the Lord high and lifted up seated upon a throne what happens when you see him his glory fills the temple and you are that temple beloved when you see him glory begins to fill this earthen vessel and the treasure begins to manifest and the glory begins to be revealed when your eyes are on Jesus but when you look around and you look up and down and you take your eyes off him you will struggle and the more you do that the more you are going to struggle he's the focus but he's also the fulfillment of the church at the end of this eighth day, you know what we're going to find? Every promise in him is yes and in him, amen, to the glory of God by us. Every bit of it is absolutely fulfilled in the person and work of Jesus. Now, just a few things here. First of all, and most importantly in this chapter to me, before we ever get down to verse 38 and 39, you'll find out in verse 29, the Benjamites were keepers of Saul's house and in the ward of Saul. Now, all of you have heard the message of the Benjamite. And tonight, we are blessed with Benjamin's portion. Tonight, if we are of any tribe, if you're going to be of any tribe, I, I appreciate the Reubenites, I appreciate the Semenites, I appreciate the Levites, I appreciate the Judites and the Zebites, and I appreciate the Iscarites and the Danites and the Gadites, and I appreciate the Asherites, and I appreciate the Naphtalites, and I appreciate all of the Josephites, but if you're going to identify with one of those tribes, you better learn how to identify with Benjamin, because Benjamin received what was rightfully God's intent for us to have. It was the Benjamin portion. It's the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them that are sanctified. And Benjamin was keeping the ward of Saul. And that's a picture of the church called to grace. What else is there besides this amazing grace? I'm saved by grace tonight. I'm sustained by grace. I'm supernatural by grace. And God is sovereignly blessing me because of a grace that I could not comprehend. I could not earn. I could not learn. It is above beyond what I could ask or think. It is Christ dying my death. Jesus rising, giving me his life. It is grace. And so he's telling you here, these Benjamites who had the portion, who had the five-time blessing, yet they were in the house of Saul, keeping Saul's things, and they were taking care of that which was of a former king and that which did not belong to them. Are you listening? There's a lot of people 
in Saul's house tonight that are called to be Benjamites. Do you remember the eight blessings of Benjamin that none of the other tribes had? And I do not divide the body, but there is a distinction. Benjamin got what those other men did not get. And he didn't get it because he was qualified, because he tithed, or because he gave, or because he prayed, or because he fasted. He got it because of where he came from. Do you remember? Number one, he's the only one that came from the foundation of a death of a lamb. Number one, his blessing was foundation. Number two, the father named him Benjamin and the father only named one of those sons. The other 10 were named by Leah or the midwives. Benjamin was called Benjamin by the father. God has called you blessed tonight. God has called you redeemed. God has called you healed. God has called you delivered. God has called you anointed, appointed, ordained. God has called you. No man has a right to call you. The hope of his calling, he has called you son or daughter. He has called you. Father has called you. Number three, the only one that got the word of grace from Joseph was Benjamin. The Lord be gracious unto you, my son. Genesis 43, 29. The word of favor. You have a word of his grace which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among them which are sanctified. You have this word of grace. Now what you do with it's up to you. Nothing more that I can do. I've laid everything that I am and everything I can do down and thank you that it is of grace that it might be a faith and now I understand this grace lets me believe. This grace energizes and empowers my faith. I believe tonight because it is of grace. God's riches at Christ's expense. It's of grace. None of the other boys got that word. There are a lot of people in the body of Christ that resist, reject, and believe and refuse the word of his grace. They despise it. They'll call it greasy grace, sloppy grace, uh, cheap grace. And if you can use the word sloppy, greasy, or cheap, you ain't talking about grace. I don't know where you got your theology, and I don't care which preacher it is. If you can use those three words and connect it to grace, you do not have a revelation of grace. Grace ain't nothing sleazy about it, ain't nothing sloppy about it, ain't nothing certainly cheap about it. It cost him every drop of blood in his body. It cost him three days and three nights in the lowest pit. It cost him dearly. He gave everything to bring you his amazing, wonderful, life-changing, life-transforming, supernatural, abundant, abiding, abounding grace so he can minister to you, manifest in you, and multiply through you, and become a blessing to everything around you his grace is all encompassing in the new covenant the lord be gracious to you let me prophesy to you tonight michael the lord be gracious unto you pastor gary slater the lord be gracious unto you patricia the lord be gracious unto you all of you tonight the lord be gracious unto you receive that it's the word of his grace he received that and none of the others got that word number four he got five times the food in the famine now you hear tonight and you listen in a lot of places where things are being preached and said that are sad at best you sit here tonight in a Benjamin feast you sit here tonight your ears open you sit here tonight hearing this message of transition into a greater glory into the glory of God seeing Jesus unveil you're in a Benjamin's feast you've got five times as much now take advantage of it do something with it don't just have it do something with it feast on it feed on it until it becomes a part of you it's part of your conscience it's part of your character it's part of your conversation your conviction your conduct and your confidence is brimming and overflowing because you know you've got an unfair advantage you know what your unfair advantage is God is for you no weapon formed against you will prosper God's on your side he's your foundation he's your strength he's your holiness he's your healing he will not let you fail you are his sons and daughters you have an unfair advantage no weapon formed against you will prosper I just wish to God I would have believed that in 2010 Man, I'm telling you what, in 2010, I sweat until the sweat could sweat no more. I, I, I walked the floors at night. I wrung my hands. I passed up dinners. I did all kinds of things, worried, fretting, trying to find an answer. And all the time, he's gently whispering, no weapon formed against you will prosper. Every tongue that rises against you in judgment, you will condemn it. This is your heritage. Your righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. But oh, my doubt brought great blindness into my life. The word of his grace, you have five times as much, but you need to feed on it. That's four. The foundation, the father named him, the favor, the word of God, then the feast in the time of famine. He feasted, he had food in the famine. That's four. Number five, he got a revelation of the silver cup. Benjamin's the only one that had the silver cup in his sack. You know, this is your sack of grain. This is the grain of the kingdom of God, except Colonel Wheat fall in the ground and die. This is a book about his life and death. And you've got a sack of grain, but you've got to find the silver cup. He put it in your sack. 
He put it in your sack. It belongs to you. The silver cup is the cup of redemption. You have been redeemed and Jesus drank your cup tonight. Jesus drank the cup of your sickness. He drank the cup of your sin. He drank the cup of your death. He drank the cup of your curse. He drank your cup so he could give you his cup. That's the glory of the exchange. And the truth is that if he didn't drink all of your cup, you couldn't drink his cup. The silver cup belongs to Benjamin and no one else. Number six, Benjamin got five changes of raiment. The other men got one change of raiment. And if you get in the word and you do like those other men would do in other parts of the body of Christ, you'll get a change. They'll bring some change. God will change you. But total change. I mean, absolute radical change to where you look at yourself and you just laugh because you don't even recognize you anymore. Every once in a while now, I'll start talking to people and I'll step back and say, Ooh, that's a different John Cahill than I have known in times past. That's just so different. And it becomes effortless because there's been a change. God will let you put on the Lord Jesus Christ. God will let you put on. When you start putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, you that have been baptized into Christ have put on. You have settled into. You have put on the Lord Jesus. And the Lord Jesus is just so revolutionary. Financially, it's different. And socially, it's different. And physically, it's different. And mentally, it's different. And the soul rim is different. And the spiritual rim is different. You get five changes of raiment. Your life will radically shift. And then Benjamin got 300 pieces of silver in the time of famine. And Josephus said these pieces of silver, they weren't just coins. They were wagon wheel sized pieces of solid silver. Wagon wheel sized pieces of pure solid silver. That young boy had to have several wagons and several teams of mules to pull his money around. Here comes Benjamin. How you know? You sell him all them wagons behind him and carrying his money. Where'd he get that, Joseph? Now let me let, let me just be real clear. Yeah, that's carnal. No, no, no. Money's a tool. Money's a tool. And as long as the church sits without money, we're going to be pretty much powerless in this dimension. And the Lord told me again today, he said, the earth is mine, the gold, the silver, all of it belongs to me. I made it for man. He said, the wrong crowd's got the money. I want to get some money into your hands. But I can't give it to people who don't have a certain kind of heart. It takes a certain heart to handle a lot of money. Wagon wheel pieces of silver. Can you imagine? And of course, you could get spiritual and preach three and 100, spirit, soul, and body redemption, a full manifestation. You could do that, but that was still silver in the time of famine. I believe both are true. I believe they're both true. Praise God. You know, let me just say it this way. I've had good money, and I've been broke. I can tell you, it's just better to have good money. I may not be the sharpest knife in the drawer. It's just better. You know, let me tell you this. I've been sick, and I've been healed. I can tell you, heals better. Heals better. I've laid in a deathbed, and I've been up healthy and strong as an ox today. I can tell you, today was better than two years ago laying in a deathbed. I can tell you. So he got finances in the time of famine and then finally he got fulfillment. God was so determined to fulfill this word to Benjamin of his grace that down through the ages of generation after Jacob cursed Benjamin, the last thing, this is so sad, the first thing he said to Benoni was your name is Benjamin. He changed his name and he rescued it from a life of pain. He rescued that boy. He said, you're not Benoni, you're Benjamin. He rescued him. First thing he said, last thing he said to him was, Benjamin, you're a wolf. You're a wolf. You will eat the prey in the morning, devour the spoil at night. You're a wolf. And he died calling his last son, Benjamin, a wolf. And Jacob speaks to the church. He never got it until he died. And Joseph said to the embalmers of Egypt, embalm my father. And Joseph prophesied, embalm my father, Israel. He lived like Jacob. He died as Israel. And he got embalmed as Israel. And that's where most of the church is. They're going to wake up one morning after they leave their body and they're going to realize it's all theirs. And you can be one of them or you can come on until now. You have a choice. So in this story, the Benjamites are keeping Saul's house. They're living out of Saul's portion. They're living out of what Saul had, fleshly king. It's flesh and grace. So let me just encourage you tonight. Come on, let's step into the grace of God. 
Oh, Father, just, just, oh, here it is. Isaiah 53, 6. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. In Revelation 1, 17 and 18, John said, he laid his right hand on me. Because God laid his left hand on Jesus, God can lay his right hand on you. The left hand is where the goats go on the day of judgment. All the judgment fell on him. He could take his right hand and put it on you and he laid it on John. Lord, lay it on this house. Lay it on our heart. Fill us. Use us for your glory and let the grace of God come in unprecedented proportions. Now, there's a problem when the Benjamites are in Saul's house keeping Saul's kingdom. There's a, there's a problem. We've all done that. We're delivered from that now. I'm coming to my place as Benjamin. I'm coming to the table. I'm coming now. Praise God. I'm a Benjamin. I'm a son of the right hand. I know I'm seated with him in the heavens. I am a Benjamite. Praise God. Quick and raised and seated with him until you take your seat. You can't be a Benjamite. Now, very quickly. Notice what he says here. All the men of war. We could talk here for a few minutes about the past. You know what? I have been in church a long time and I've been in some wicked battles. Can I tell you that I didn't get where I am tonight without a lot of struggle? Can I tell you that this kind of word comes with a lot of demonic activity? That this kind of pressing into God comes with a lot of opposition, a lot of struggle, a lot. Persecution and affliction does what? It arises for the word's sake. Oh, I want to have the word you do. Do you really? Do you really? You really want this? Persecution and affliction arises for the word's sake. So I've been a man of war. I fought the church battles. I fought the church bosses. I have fought the church denomination. I fought the book of the minutes. I have fought against the traditions of men. And I fought and I fought and I fought and I fought. But I thank God my war is over. I'm so glad. I can shout tonight, my war is over. And there's only one fight I'll be part of. And that's the good fight of faith. And if it's not the good fight of faith, you can just count me out. No time to fuss, fight, and argue anymore. Those days are over. It's the good fight of faith that we are going to hold fast to. There's the past. You could talk about the bloodbath and all that we've all gone through. You could talk about the church, the pain, the hurt, the wound, the things we received in church, the people that betrayed us, the hurt, the wound. Leadership hurt you. You may have hurt leadership. It just goes endlessly on. Men of war. These men had been in war. They'd been in battle. These people that come to this place, they had been in a fight for their life. There have been a few days when I didn't know if I could ever do this again. There have been a few days when I didn't know I could ever stand up here again. A few, not many, but a few been in a battle. I've been in a furnace. How about you? I'm not a novice. I got the smell of smoke. Yeah, I know what it is. I've been in the furnace. I know what that is. They were men of war. That's the past. But notice this. There was great potential here. They were men. And men speaks not of, of uh, stature and it doesn't just speak of gender. It speaks of maturity. These were men. I've been through some things, but I can tell you tonight, I'm mature enough to know now that this is all based on a relationship. I can tell you now, I'm matured enough to know that this is about me and my father. And if I just keep my eyes on him, keep my eyes on Jesus, then no matter what others do or don't do, that is going to determine my destiny. And it's the same for you. You must look at him. It is between you come to a place of maturity where what you need is Jesus. And one of the greatest days you're ever going to come to is the day you realize you might have to walk this out by yourself. And quit waiting for somebody. Quit looking for somebody to encourage you, to prop you up, to pray you up, to get you in church. And just, if people won't come, you come. And if people won't get in the Word, you get in the Word. And if they won't pray, that don't matter to me. I'm going to do it anyway. You've got to, it's one of the greatest days you'll come to is when you realize you may have to do it by yourself. But you won't be by yourself. He'll be with you. He'll teach you. He'll lead you. He'll guide you. He'll show you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. His name is Jesus. You know how many preachers have walked away from me over the years? How many people have turned their back? How many people have went away? But I'm going forward. Go back to Sunday morning just for a moment. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. Oh, there's such potential in men and women of God if we will just go forward. Then notice this, this is very important as well. Their posture. Notice they were able to keep rank. That's a posture of military honor. Rank always denotes a military honor. And please know this, that the house of God 
is a culture of honor. Anytime we function in dishonor towards the Lord or towards one another, we're always going to struggle. When God brought them out of Egypt, he required them to walk in the harness, which was in groups and lines of five. Five. And you could teach that. That's grace. You can teach that apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. But they could keep the rank. And if you really understand the rank, you know where I belong, you know where you belong, you know where you belong. You take your place where does grace flow? To the lowest, to the last, and to the least. That's my rank. What's your rank in the body of Christ? I'm last, I'm less, and I'm lost. Last, lowest, and least. That's me. I'm not lost. I'm found in Christ. You know your rank? Can you keep the rank? Jesus said when you come into the feast, take the lowest seat. And Jesus said, he that's first shall be last, but he that's last shall be first. What a revelation at the pool of Bethesda that if someone would have just had the courage to step aside and let others go first, he could have set up that whole, whole scenario for miracle after miracle. All it take was one person to receive the message of revelation. And I am, Paul said in Ephesians 3, I am less than the least of all saints. I'm less than the least. So... For me to keep rank, that's easy. I just lift you up. I just put you before me. Esteem others better than yourself. Let every man look on the things of others, not his own. Esteem others better than yourself. How easy that is. Can you keep the rank? My rank is last in the body of Christ. I'm less than the least of all saints. And I am in the lowest seat. That's my rank. Couldn't be happier. We all don't look very happy. <laughs> Praise God. Their posture, the perfect heart, uh, that has to do with shalom. It has to do with the revelation of peace and shalom. And, of course, you know that peace is what that's about, is shalom, which is a derivative of shalom, and it means the perfect heart, the heart that's ruled by peace. And notice the place they came to. They came to Hebron. Hebron is the seat of covenant. Where is the seat of covenant for you? Where is it? Quick and raised, and that's your seat. That's your Hebron. Hebron for you is seated with him. They came to Hebron. And notice what they did. They came for one reason, to make David, whose name means beloved, king over all Israel, and the rest also of Israel with one heart to make David king. Notice that they came with purpose. Jesus is Lord. We've got one message. There's only one message. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. If you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you shall be saved. Hallelujah. Only one message. Jesus is Lord. And the provision, three days, eating and drinking. Never get away from it, no matter how far you go. You're always going to be brought back here. Always. Three days and three nights. What he did in death, what he does in life, always comes together. He provided for them richly and continually by eating and drinking. And there they are feasting again in the glory of Jesus' lordship. Let's stand together tonight. That's as far as we'll go. We'll go to the last scripture. And this is what Paul said of this same thought. These things are working until we all come. Till we all come in the unity of of the faith. That faith is very simple. Jesus is Lord. And the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, that's the body of Christ, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God having measured the body of Christ to stand in the revelation of His Son. Jesus is Lord tonight. Now, what you see in the body of Christ right now, and I could preach this from 50 different places, there must be a returning to the lordship of Jesus. There must be a flow back to the lordship of Jesus. This is the first step in seeing glory come in our generation. 
is for Jesus to be Lord. Jesus be glorified. Father, in the name of your son, Jesus, we bless you tonight. We thank you tonight. We glorify you tonight. You are worthy. You are holy. And so, Lord, I thank you. Benjamites in this room, Lord. Those that are called to a Benjamite feast. Lord, we come out of Saul's house tonight. We come out of keeping the wards of Saul and all that Saul was and all that he did, all that fleshly stuff we've been in in days gone by. We lay it down gladly and come out tonight joyfully. Joyfully we come out and we bless your name and we honor you. And we confess boldly that Jesus is Lord over this place, over this people. He is Lord in this house and we give you praise and honor. We give you thanksgiving. Jesus is Lord forever. Now in Jesus' name. Now thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Reign, reign over us as we take our seat. Reign mightily in power and glory. And I thank you and praise you for the provision of the eating and drinking of the kingdom of God. We feast and we feed together. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And in agreement we said together, amen. 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 All right. Before we go, does anybody have any questions or anything?